No, I don't hate that boy. But I pity the fool. Pity the fool. Pity the fool. Pity the fool. a message called a family fool and the first week I talked about a real and fool how our foolishness it reels us out of control last week uh, I talked about um, too much fool and how sometimes too much of a good thing can cause us to be foolish and this week I want to talk about a family fool I think about my parents and how they set me on a course where I really believed that anything was possible they instilled confidence in me uh, they instilled a belief that I could do anything I put my mind to. But they also instilled some values of common sense and uh, they taught me about finances and they taught me about uh, being wise and treating others uh, the way that they would want to be treated and loving people no matter the color of their skin and not seeing uh, life and people from a perspective of the flesh but from a godly perspective. And certainly they were not perfect um, and neither am I, but I believe my parents really instilled some, some real practicals uh, in my life, some God DNA things in my life that helped shape me. And unfortunately for many of us, uh, we did not grow up in good, healthy family circumstances and situations. We did not grow up uh, with good parents, with moms, dads. We were very much orphans. Even though maybe mom and dad were there, we felt all alone and we had no example of godliness or righteousness. We had no example of how to live. And I was looking at some, some statistics, and I saw 40% of people's first marriage ends in divorce, 40% or more. 60% of their second marriages end in divorce, and then over 73% of their third marriages end in divorce. So what that tells me is that uh, in our world, particularly in our nation, that a lot of us have grown up in very broken homes. Because of that, because we've grown up in broken homes, uh, oftentimes our vision and our understanding of life has been split. Or we might get a perspective from a dad who was not always there or a perspective of a mother who was dating and uh, looking for someone to fill a void or uh, someone who was angry or hurt or broken or or we, we grew up with a mom who had to be mom and dad or we grew up with a dad who was had to be mom and dad and we, we come from so many backgrounds and so many situations and sometimes we've seen so much of not what to do but really of what not to do. Today I want to help impart some wisdom in us as we are involved in families as we raise our own kids or as we uh, are in our marriages or even as we're a part of a greater community, a greater fellowship of believers. As we have and are a part of families, what do we do that and how do we live that allows us to be um, mature, mature and how do we live that, that allows us to be effective and uh, add to the families that we're in? And I wrote a few things down about foolishness. We've been doing this every single week, uh, what foolishness says or what foolishness is. And for this week, I wrote down, foolishness says, I need it now. Wisdom says, what I need will be there when I need it. Foolishness says, what's important to me is obviously important to you. Whereas wisdom says, if I value you, you are more likely to understand me. Foolishness makes excuses. Wisdom makes the effort. And foolishness says me, me, and me. Whereas wisdom says you and me. And I think as we think about our parents and our family dynamics and our relationships, we could probably relate to some foolishness that we give off or some foolishness that we've experienced. And today I want to hit a few uh, wisdom practicals from God's Word uh, that I think will allow us to be effective family members and lead 
be a part of grow in our families or our greater community. So number one today, um, number one, fools cheat. Fools cheat. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 16, a heartless leader is a fool. But anyone who refuses to get rich by cheating others will live a long time. Anyone who refuses to cheat others will live a long time. Kind of makes me think of of movies, uh, you know, where, where the gangsters or where the bad guys, uh, where they're cheating people, but death is going to knock on their door real quick because you get what you put in. You always, you always reap what you sow. And if you sow cheating and if you sow uh, lying and if you sow, uh, if you sow bad things, oftentimes, according to God's word, those things will find you and you'll reap what you sow. Of course, we know that by God's grace, we know that grace and love covers a multitude of sins. And as we shift and as we turn our ways, oftentimes what we deserve, we don't get because of God's grace. But if we live in a pattern of cheating, uh, we are going to end up receiving the brunt of that. The Bible also says in Proverbs 21, 6, cheating to get rich is a foolish dream and no less than suicide. Wow. And the Bible is intense, particularly Proverbs, how serious and how uh, cut and dry the Bible can be. I want to read that passage again. Cheating to get rich is a foolish dream and no one, and no less than suicide. No less than suicide. Man, I, I, people and their money. We get very protective and when we cheat people on their money, uh, oftentimes we experience a great brunt of that. And there's no really quick way to be rich. There really isn't. And when we chase that, when we chase wealth and we feel like, man, if I just get rich or if I just get wealthy or if I just get stuff, then I'll be happy or I can take care of others. And really what your family needs you to do and be and really what your friends and relationships need you to be is steady and consistent and not worry so much about what if and stop romanticizing about getting rich quick and all my problems will go away and oftentimes oftentimes uh, if we would have just taken care of things when they happened then we wouldn't be in the debt and the mess that we're in right now we, we think that if we take out this loan to cover this loan or pay this credit card to cover this credit card or do this or do that, uh, then we'll be able to catch up later. And oftentimes that's never the case. And so what we need to do as people and as people of God is to stop the foolishness and know that we cannot spend more than we make. And getting and living to try to get rich quick or starting some business here because we think that's the fastest way to get money here. That's not how life works. And I don't think that's how God intended us to live. I think what God wants from us is steady and consistent. He wants love from us. He wants peace from us. He wants us to work hard and add to society. And as we do that, we find fulfillment in not money, not things, but in people in our relationships and in our family. And for some of us who work big jobs and long hours to make ends meet and we spend so much time working, I understand that, I get it. But in our culture, it's very difficult for us to shut down and turn off. When we get home, we're still typing emails and we're still on the phone and we're still on social media and we're still checking in with our bosses. And at some point we have to remember and realize what is life all about? Is it about toiling and working and paying the bills or is it a balance of both? Is it about when you're somewhere being there and being with your family? Because when you cheat to try to get rich or when you're cheating your family out of your time, you're hurting yourself. Andy Stanley wrote a great book called Choosing to Cheat. I loved that book. I remember reading it before I got married and thinking to myself, I'll never, ever, ever have these issues of worrying about work so much that I'm cheating on my family at home. Uh, but sure enough, got married in ministry. My wife has a, has a great job and she does a lot of stuff uh, in her employment. And um, and, and, and at times we'll be at home laying in bed with the laptops out, 
answering emails at 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. And what, what I realize is oftentimes we're cheating on each other. We don't even realize it. And so it's important for us on two factors to, to, to not cheat to get ahead and not lie to get ahead, but at the same time not cheat our families by not being where we're at. My youth pastor always used to say this. He used to say, when you're somewhere, be there. I think it's a challenge for all of us. Fools cheat. Let's not cheat. Number two, fools are never cautious. Fools are never cautious. Proverbs 14, 16 says, only a stupid fool is never cautious. So be extra careful and stay out of trouble. Fools are never cautious. I read this New York Times article and it kind of went like this. It says, play hooky, disappear for the weekend. Have a fling. Binge, binge shop. Uh, spontaneity can be a healthy defiance of routine, an expression of starved desire. Some psychologists say, yet for scientists who study mental illness and addiction, impulsive behavior, impulsive behavior, the tendency to act or react with little thought, has emerged as an all-purpose plague. In recent years, studies have linked impulsiveness to higher risks of smoking, drinking, and drug abuse. People who attempt suicide score highly, score highly on measures of impulsivity, as do adolescents with eating problems, aggression, compulsive gambling, severe personality disorders, and attention deficit problems are all associated with high impulsiveness. A uh, problem that affects an estimated 9% of Americans, according to a nationwide mental health survey completed last year. Interesting article, um, really talking about behavior and some of the uh, effects of impulsive behavior. And certainly some of us uh, in, in our brains and in our minds and things have been passed down from generation to generation. And there are some chemical imbalances for some of us that we fight and that we deal with uh, that cause impulsiveness. But I wrote this down. Our impulsive patterns will eventually hurt our most important relationships. Our impulsive patterns will eventually hurt our most important important relationships and certainly there are things that we've got to fight uh, there are things that have been passed down from us from parents and from grandparents there are generational things that have been passed down to us curses that people have put on us there are some of us really struggle with with emotional disorders and, and depression and anxiety and attention deficit uh, disorders and things of, of that nature uh, you're looking at somebody who Man, struggled so bad at school, struggled so bad in school, and, and, and tried to keep up, uh, but, but never really could uh, because I, I, I just struggled to focus. And of course, as I've gotten older, I, I've, I've found some, some ways around that. I've found some ways uh, to, 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 uh, to take uh, my attention deficit, my inability to focus at times, I've found ways to, to fight that. Uh, drinking coffee for me is one of those ways. The caffeine really calms me down. The point is this, that all of us fight and struggle with particular things in our life that might cause us to be impulsive. And I think for us, if we're not careful with our impulsive behaviors, we're going to hurt important relationships. And some of us, we when we're struggling or when we're stressed or when we have anxiety, we're, we go to the store and we shop or we go to the kitchen and we eat. We go to the alcohol and we abuse it. Uh, we uh, get angry and we throw things or fight things or we push things and punch it. Whatever it is, I think all of us have a tendency at times to be impulsive or we say yes when we shouldn't say yes because uh, we don't want to not please someone or we don't want to reject somebody because of our fear of being rejected. Whatever it is, whatever our impulsivity issues are, it's important that we are continually and constantly filled with God's spirit or we will live a lifestyle of foolishness and we will hurt our families. We really will. And I think the only remedy uh, for impulsivity is inviting God's spirit to fill us. The Bible says that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
And Romans 12 teaches us to invite God's spirit and offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing that this would be our spiritual act of worship. And as we do that, our minds will begin to be renewed. It's important that when we feel the sense of impulsivity, when we feel like being impulsive, that we take a step back and ask ourselves, am I acting in love? Am I acting in joy? Am I acting in peace? Am I being patient or do I want what will probably be there later? And I love that about God's spirit. I love that God gives us the option to pull back. And for me in my life, Whenever we have to make big decisions, sometimes even small decisions, I always like to sleep on it. I think a 24-hour rule in life uh, really would benefit many of us greatly. Uh, that instead of just saying yes or instead of just saying no, leave room for God's Spirit to speak to us and be cautious about decisions we make and relationships we get into and uh, people we connect with and business partners that we deal with. I think many of us were so hungry and so starved to be in a relationship or to have a spouse or for our kids to like us that we just say yes right away, but you are doing your family and your life a disservice when you don't just pull back and say, I need to be cautious here because God's spirit, when you give him room, will speak to you. If you uh, leave room for God's spirit and you, instead of making decisions right away, say, God, I need to leave room here. Oftentimes, a sense of peace will come in for the yes or for the no, uh, or, or a sense of caution will come in. And, and, and you'll know in your heart, you'll sense, the Bible says that my sheep, uh, those who know me and I know them, will hear and know my voice. And when you leave room for God's spirit, I believe you'll hear the voice of the good shepherd often giving you the go ahead to proceed or the pause to say not now. Pause to say not now. And I want you to know something. Not now doesn't mean no forever. It doesn't. And oftentimes God gives us a not now uh, and, and a be cautious because he wants to protect us. And, and, and because we're impulsive and because uh, we're not cautious all the times, we think that not now and protection, we see it as rejection. But God loves us so much. And he cares for us so much. He cares for you deeply. Even as you're watching this right now, God's spirit is in your business, in your room right now, trying to love on you and telling you to take a step back and calm down and be at peace. I don't, I don't give you a spirit of fear. I, I give you a, a sound mind. And as you pause and as you leave room for the good shepherd to come in and speak to you, oftentimes the decisions you make will be right. And the Bible says that if you seek me, you'll find me. If you search for me with your whole heart. And, and oftentimes in our life, we don't take time to seek the Lord. And we get mad at him when we make bad decisions and say, how could you let this happen, God? But really, we didn't pause long enough to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. So don't be foolish. We've got to be cautious. All right, number three. Fools are never content. Fools are never content never content. I, I watched um, I watched a movie the other uh, night called uh, 13 Hours. It was the movie about the Benghazi um, the, the Benghazi situation and uh, they were up on the roof and I'm not going to give the movie away but they were up on the roof shooting and uh, protecting and they had this moment where in between their battles uh, they would have some, some quiet dead time and uh, one of the main characters uh, who is Jim from The Office, which was quite weird that he was in a very serious movie, although he did a good job. Uh, he looks at the other guy and he says, why do I always end up back here as a contractor for the CIA? Why can't I just go home and stay home? Why can't I just be content? Why am I always warring and fighting? And Part of that was probably who he is, but uh, in the movie he has children and family at home and he's thinking about them in the movie and for many of us um, we each and every day get up and we're looking for a battle we're looking for something else to fulfill us but if we would just look in our house or look in our heart and look in our life and realize we got a lot of good things for some of us men um, we have a wandering eye and we're always looking for what could fulfill 
our, our, our souls and our minds. And so we wander with our eyes and we're looking for women uh, to gratify us and to satisfy us. But we've got a lot of good things. We've got wives at home and kids at home. And we have everything we could possibly need. Why are we looking elsewhere? And, and the tendency of the foolish is to look beyond instead of look within. And the Bible says in, in Philippians 4.11, probably one of my favorite scriptures, Paul speaking, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. That's beautiful. He, he's saying, I know how to live on nothing. I know how to live beat up in jail and naked and I know how to but and I also know how to live with food and clothes and money and I'm good either way you can take everything and I'll still be good or you can give me everything and I'll still be good and last week we talked about um, I was joking in the beginning of my message talking about winning the lottery and and uh, Mark Cuban's statement that if you uh, if you're not happy now and you win the lottery you won't be happy with more money. But if you're already happy and you win the lottery, then you'll be a whole lot happier. And I think that's what Paul is explaining here. He's saying, take it or leave it. I'm good because I'm good in my soul and I'm content because Jesus is enough and what I have is enough. My identity is in Christ. And of course, Paul uh, goes on to say to, 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 to die is, is gain. It's to, to know and be with Christ. And I'm good with that if I die, and I'm good with that if I live, because I'm with him either way. And man, what a challenge to all of us. And then uh, he says, I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. And then that's 4.11 and 12. And then 4.13 says, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do anything. And for many of us, we've misquoted that scripture plenty, uh, believing that I can do anything, I can pass this test, I can conquer the world, I can have a massive church, I can make a lot of money, I can do all things, you know. But really, I, I think what Paul's communicating there is that contentment is the prerequisite to miracles. And I think that he's saying for us that the I can do anything is more about I can get through anything because life short. It's simple. It's, excuse me, it's not simple. It's complex. It's short, uh, but it's quick. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. And we exist, yes, to thrive, but at times we've got to get through. And in our get throughing, we can also experience thriving. And the way that we have peace and happiness is joy is saying in all circumstances, whether clothed or naked, well-fed, hungry, Whatever it is, I'm content. I'm good with where God's got me. I'm good with what I have. And certainly I press on to win the prize. Certainly I climb mountaintops to go from glory to glory. But in this season, in this moment, I look around at my wife and I look around at my kids and I look around at my circumstance and my job and I, I'm good. I'm good. Take the world and give me Jesus. And I think if more of us thought like that and function like that, I think we'd be happier in our mess. And then when God chooses to pour out blessing over us, we'd be all the more happier and would be able to sustain it. But unfortunately, when we get more, it's just another high that wears off. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. I want to be good and content with where I'm at right now so that when God gives me more, I'll steward it well. I'll steward it well. You with me? Number four, and this is the last one. Fools make a mess of their family. Fools make a mess of their family. Proverbs 14.1 A woman's family is held together by her wisdom, but it can be destroyed by her foolishness. By her foolishness. Proverbs 15.5 Don't be a fool and disobey your parents. Be smart and accept God. Don't be a fool and disobey. Be smart. Accept correction. You know, what's interesting about that last passage is 
Uh, some of us, um, we, we, we didn't have great parents and we've had to listen to that. And, but you know, God's word is strong, it's powerful, it's real. And sometimes we have to honor and obey the authorities in our life, even when our authorities are wrong. But don't you think that God loves you enough to bless you in the midst of your challenging circumstances? And God, God follows through on his word. It will not re return empty. And so in our honoring and in our listening to correction and in our trusting and in our submitting to authority, our bosses, our employers, our parents, young person, as we honor them, even when they're wrong, God's gonna bless us for it and make a way. He's gonna work out all things for our good, even what seems like bad things. And I, I think if we don't start now, maybe you're young, maybe you don't have kids yet, maybe you just got married, maybe you're dating or you're engaged, maybe you're a teenager watching this, and you have an opportunity right now to listen and accept correction. I, I would encourage you to, to start that pattern now, to be teachable, to be teachable. Because wisdom comes from instruction, but if you hate instruction, if you don't enjoy and if you don't long for discipline, uh, you'll, never, you'll never walk in those patterns as you get older. It's very hard to, to rethink and repurpose and recorrect patterns. And for some of us, we've been living a certain way for 30 and 40 years, and then to try to turn that around, it's hard work. And my thought for you is start right now. Sow those seeds of honor. Sow those seeds of respect. Sow those seeds of, of, uh, of correction and of instruction and loving discipline and loving correction now uh, so that when you get older and when you have your own children that you'll reap what you sowed and so that when you have employees you'll reap what you sowed and so that uh, when you are leading churches that you'll have people who honor you and, and whatever it is practice those things now uh, so that you don't make a mess of your family so that you don't make a mess of your business so that you don't make a mess of your employee uh, employment or your employees or your businesses or your churches and and maybe right now as I speak and close, you uh, have made a mess of your family. You've made a mess of your life. Maybe maybe as I speak to this, you, you feel the, the, the conviction of God's spirit. And, but I want you to know something that there's a difference between conviction and, and condemnation. Condemnation tells you that you're awful and that you'll never get it right. Conviction uh, brings about godly sorrow maybe some tears that turn us around and set us on a course for winning. And I believe right now that some of us are experiencing conviction in our life about some of these particular areas that we've cheated, we've lied, we've been uh, impulsive, we've made a mess of our lives and our families, but I believe that God's grace is large and huge and massive and that God's grace gives us what we don't deserve, which is another chance and it doesn't matter where you're at. Maybe you've made a mess. But God's presence and His Spirit and His grace is here right now to breathe new life into you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, it says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Some of us, we just need to cry. We just need to allow God's spirit to do a work in us and, and repent and weep for our sin and, and cry and confess our mess. But as we do that and after we do that, and as we respond to God and say, I'm sorry for my sin, forgive me, pick ourselves up, wipe ourselves off and move on and go and win and apply God's spirit and invite God's spirit into every aspect of our life. And the Bible says in Matthew 6, to seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first God's spirit. Seek first what God would call us to. And he'll add everything else that matters to your life. So right now, as I speak to you and as I close this time, for some of us, we need to respond to God and repent for our foolishness. We need to repent um, and we need to invite him in. We need to invite his spirit in. For others, uh, 
we've never received Christ as our Lord and our Savior, as our leader. We've never said, Jesus, lead the way. Or maybe we have, but we never actually meant it, and we never got out of the way to let him be the leader. Or maybe we've been running from God for years, and we know we need to come home. And I want to pray a prayer with you right now. I want you to say it out loud. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that you'll be saved. And it's not a magic prayer. We believe it's a starting point uh, for your journey with Jesus. And so let's pray this prayer together, okay? I'm going to keep my eyes locked on the, on the camera, but I want you to maybe close your eyes and focus on the cross and pray this with me. Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you that I don't deserve what you're about to give to me, but I receive it anyway. Forgive me of my sin. I repent turn from my ways. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe in you. I'm trusting you today to be my Lord, my Savior, my leader, my pastor, my shepherd. Fill me with your spirit right now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, uh, we believe that uh, you have a fresh start and that something new has begun. The Bible says that when we're in Christ, the old is gone, the new has come. And uh, for some of us, we're experiencing real godly sorrow about our sin and our foolishness. Uh, but I want to encourage you to get around some believers, uh, get around some people in church. And, and, and if you're not a part of a Bible teaching church, then get connected to one and find one and, 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 and make some relationships and some accountability that, that imposes wisdom where there's foolishness. We love you so much. If you're ever uh, in the Philadelphia area, um, we'd love to have you at the Block Church, where we believe God's called us to revive our city one block at a time. Thanks for being with us today. God bless you. And join us next week um, for week four, the final week of How to Spot a Fool. If you'd like to sow into the ministry, please head to www.theblockchurch.org. Click on Giving and Ways to Give. There are three ways to give at the Block Church. You can give online for a one-time contribution on our online form. You can schedule your giving and create a profile for it to come out. Or you can mail a check to the Block Church, P.O. Box 18055, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19147. Thanks for listening to the Block Church Podcast. If we can pray for you in any way, send us an email to prayer at theblockchurch.org or visit our website, theblockchurch.org. If you're ever in the area, come visit us.